Stephen Doggett, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for your time. Um, Stephen, for anybody that doesn't know you yet, can you um, uh, introduce yourself, please? Yeah, well, thank you, Daniel. And it's a great pleasure to have a chat to you today from so far. Oh, and yeah. so I'm Stephen, Stephen Doggett. So I'm the head of medical entomology at Westmead Hospital in Sydney, Australia. So most of my work revolves around mosquitoes. Um, where we actually test uh, mosquitoes for the presence of mosquito-borne disease. But I'm better known for this creature behind, namely bed bugs. Mm -hmm. And so over the years, I've been involved in research, um, teaching, education, and I was in chief editor of the first industry, industry standard on bed bugs called a code of practice for the control of bed bug infestations mm -hmm. in Australia. I've had a number of students, had a lot of publications, fortunately have spoken around the world, and most recently I've had um, been the chief editor of a very exciting book on bed bugs, which um, I believe we're going to talk about later. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. You being the chief editor, author, and, and the manager of, of, your, um, uh, of the hospital, basically a lot of knowledge went into bed bugs. Uh, you found a funny correlation um, that really hit the, hit the nail in, uh, um, on the current COVID situation and uh, something correlating between COVID and bed bug treatments and pest management. So can you elaborate a little bit about that one, please? Well, one thing that did strike me was the similarities between how we control COVID or how we prevent the disease and bed bug management. And probably the best example of this is to look to see what the Taiwanese have done and see how their mitigation strategies for COVID very much parallel that with bed bugs. And so Taiwan's done a fantastic job at minimising their number of human cases. They've only had some 449 human cases and some seven deaths, which are still very um, unfortunate but compared to other nations like the US with one point, what are they, what are they up to? 3.2 million cases and 134,000 deaths. I mean, it's a stark, stark mm. contrast. And so what <clears throat> happened with Taiwan is we go back to 2003, they had an outbreak of sudden acquired respiratory syndrome disease known as SARS, which mm. is also a type of coronavirus like COVID. Mm. And they had some 70 odd deaths and some 300 odd people infected. And the health um, department and the government said, this isn't good enough. We want to protect our people. And so they immediately implemented a pandemic plan mm. in case this happened in the future. And when they suddenly heard about this inkling of some mysterious disease appearing in Wuhan in China, the plan was immediately enacted. Mm. And it revolved around preparation. It revolved increased surveillance prompt action mm -hmm. and if we look at how successful Taiwan have been so they were prepared they started acting early they initiated initiated quarantine of travelers they undertook enhanced surveillance very importantly they worked together as a nation they had the party political um, party politics were put aside it was a bipartisan approach and said we're going to work together we're going to step back and let the clinical people direct the control. They undertook factual messaging based on science and denounced misinformation mm -hmm. and even, you know, fake news. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they wanted evidence-based solutions. And so many of these factors parallel what we do with um, quality bed bug control. Mm -hmm. So if we look at preparation, for example, so for those people who run hotels, motels, staff accommodation, essentially those who provide beds for others, they really should have a management plan in place. So that if bed bugs suddenly appear in their facility, then a management plan is turned on, it's enacted. Yeah. And so back in 2011, I developed a management plan called a... Um, um, God, I've forgotten the name. <laughs> I'll think of it. So, um, so, yeah, so I developed a management plan back in 20, 2011 called a bed bug management plan, uh, bed bug management policy and procedural guide for accommodation providers. And so this management plan really had certain aspects. It basically defined who does what, so who had the task, it defined um, the, the procedures that needed in terms of um, documentation. Mm -hmm. It defined the control process. And 
Um, having a management plan in place and a management plan that's up to date can help minimise the spread of bed bugs. So that's the, the parallel between COVID in terms of preparation. Most importantly, if bed bugs is detected, you want to get onto the problem quickly. Because if you act early, the bed bugs are less likely to spread. Yeah. And spread particularly in multiple occupancy dwellings like hotels and low income housing. Mm. The Taiwanese enacted quarantine, so travellers coming back from China. They went into quarantine, and this is a case if we have an infected room with the bed bugs, and that the room has to be quarantined. Nobody should be allowed into the room, only those that have to go in for basically management. We need, like COVID, is to increase the amount of surveillance. So if you have a positive room, you inspect the adjoining rooms. If you're in a large um, accommodation block and you're getting a lot of bed bugs, there's no point just um, reacting to those that have been reported. Yeah. You should go through and inspect every single room. Yeah. And this is the key to COVID. And if we look at the most successful countries that have controlled COVID, it's the one that they haven't done a mm -hmm. they, yeah, they haven't done a little bit of testing. They've done lots of testing. Mm -hmm. So for example, in Australia, for every positive case, there's been 190, 190 tests. In China, it's about a 1,000 tests. And if we look at, say, comparison, a country that's done very poor, like the US, there's only about 10 tests that have been done for every positive case. And this is in spite of President Trump saying that they've done a lot of testing. Yes, they have done a lot of testing, some 40, 40 million um, tests, but it's tiny compared to what's needed to be mm -hmm. because you do a lot of testing to, to pick up those residual cases, those ones that haven't been detected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can be a source of infection for wider society. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with bed bugs. You want to pick up those rooms sure. that haven't been detected, that haven't been uncovered, because then they become a source mm -hmm. for other inf infections, infestations. And so, again, there's a lot of parallels there. Mm -hmm. But to keep going, um, so cooperation. As I said, in Taiwan, Everybody got together with the one objective. They're on the one path to control COVID. Mm -hmm. They didn't have politicians that said, oh, you know, free this state or free that state or we no, don't I want to wear masks. Mm. No, they were, the society was united. And this is similar to bed bugs. And so in, in the case of COVID, those societies that weren't united where basically it become a platform for one's own ideology, they're the countries that have really suffered, mm. suffered in a bad way. And so with bed bugs, the fact is when you have a bed bug infestation, you'll need people to do certain things. You yeah. may need the owner to do something. If in the case of a hotel, you may need the hotel engineering to come in or the housekeeping to disconnect, disconnect power leads, mm. to remove headboards, to lift up carpet, um, <coughs> to access areas. It may be very difficult to control. And without cooperation with bed bugs or COVID, you will fail. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing about COVID is factual messaging. And that uh, one thing with Taiwan, they were uniform in their media reports, in their messaging. They dis, dis, um, dis, um, denounce um, basically misinformation. And this is case with bed bugs as well. There's a lot of dubious products out there on the market. Um, and we don't want to um, basically encourage them. We yeah. want to denounce them. And that's something that we do through the Australian industry standard. And by only having quality evidence-based science, can we control bed bugs and can we control COVID? Yeah. And so there's all these parallels between COVID mitigation and bed bug management mm -hmm. that are just so obvious and so obvious to me. Mm -hmm. And there's one very important um, um, feature about the Taiwanese approach, mm -hmm. that their approach did cost money initially. They had to spend quite a bit of money initially. Mm -hmm. But they've saved means, if not beings, to the future. Mm -hmm. And the other th key thing is, is that so many people who recover from COVID basically have chronic health problems respiratory problems, 
heart, heart disease, and they become a burden forevermore on the health system until they pass away. And they will die earlier. <clears throat> and so by spending quite a lot of money up front, mm-hmm. you save a lot of money in the future. And a classic example of this was with a staff accommodation block that was attached to one of the major hospitals in Sydney, where bedbugs got into the facility, which had 320 rooms. If bedbugs were treated properly, it would have cost about 400 Australian dollars, so around 300 US. But they weren't treated, and they were treated very badly, and bedbugs spread. And after two years, the decision was, was to inspect every single room and treat every single room room that had bed bugs and 10% of the rooms were found which nobody knew had bed bugs but this cost went from up to from 400 Australian dollars to $40,000 to resolve. Oh my God. World Bank has said wow. that the gross domestic, domestic product of the world will go down by two trillion dollars. Two trillion dollars. No way. I'm and if we all followed the lead of Taiwan Mm. this amount would have been minuscule compared to that amount. I love it. And I think also as the chief editor of uh, Fortma magazine, I think you're going to write about that, I think, right? So, uh, Indeed. In terms Indeed. Of following you. Cool. So, yeah, so um, as you mentioned, I'm the chief editor of the Fayette mag- magazine, which I've been doing since um, January last year. And um, every, epi- every, every issue I write quite a few um, articles. And I've written a few articles about bed bugs and um, mm and other, uh, other articles, and indeed this will be written into a story. In fact, I've completed the story, and in fact, I'm actually compiling this issue right now pretty much as we speak or in between <laughs> when we speak. So um, not subscribed yet, should definitely Google for my and get a, a subscription uh, uh, ready. Uh, another thing, um, Stephen, that, I, that you uh, mentioned to me that I would love to speak about is uh, how... Um, COVID and, and, and the impact of bed bugs uh, will change society. So that's a really interesting topic and a thesis that uh, I would love to learn more about. So you're saying how bed bugs will change in society following the COVID pandemic. And to answer that, and, and so often when we wish to answer a question, it's often best to look at history mm-hmm. and see what happened in the lead up to the bed bug resurgence. So what happened with the bed bug resurgence? Mm-hmm. We believe that the modern bed bug, for want of a better term, it's the same species. The difference is that modern strains are highly resistant to the insecticides that we have out there. But we believe these modern bed bugs probably evolved in Africa. Mm-hmm. And we think that for a couple of reasons. One is that there's two species involved in the resurgence. And this is what is really strange. Most emerging issues involves one pest, one virion. It doesn't involve two at the same time. And so to, 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 to explain why that happened, we have to think, okay, well, where were both of these species a problem? And bed bug problems were still a major issue in Africa. They didn't, they didn't go through this quiescence period, this quiet period like we saw throughout the rest of the world. During the 80s, there was a lot of bed bug problems from both species and some famous researchers did a lot of work on that. And so, there, but where a lot of the bed bug problems were in Africa were in these um, villages that were being treated for, um, against malaria. And so we suspect that a lot of the um, resistance evolved inadvertently due to malaria control. Mm. And it's actually a real problem now because these modern bed bugs are incredibly resistant that they actually use bed nets, the bed nets that are used to prevent being bitten from malaria mosquitoes, from the Anopheles mosquitoes. Bed bugs are using these sites as harbourages. Mm-hmm. And so what is happening in a lot of African nations, a lot of the people have stopped using bed nets because they associate with bed bugs. And we're seeing a rise in malaria cases. Really? And it's quite extraordinary to think Bed bugs, well, they're horrible and uncomfortable. The bites are painful. But people prefer not to have bed bugs over the risk of death. And it's quite extraordinary. And I'm working with a number of African groups on this very issue today. And um, so if we go back and so we say that bed bugs probably, the modern bed bug probably evolved in Africa. 
And we started seeing bed bugs really in the backpacking industry in the late 90s. Mm. And that was the case in Australia. It was probably those younger travellers who went to these more exotic nations like Africa and went to these rural villages, these what you know we would consider fairly basic sort of villages, and probably picked up the bed bugs and brought them back. And they started spreading through backpackers. And when you think in, in, particular, uh, in particular hostels, they, they're fairly densely packed. Uh, you, you'll have six to eight people in a room. And yeah. so there was great opportunity for the bed bug populations to build up. And then we started seeing bed bugs expand, started spreading into more mainstream ho- hotels. Mm-hmm. Then people started bringing them home. Mm-hmm. And then bed bugs spread into wider society. So that we saw them in, you know, planes, trains, automobiles, um, 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 massage tables, um, retail outlets, mm-hmm. um, cafes, brothels. Um, I've <laughs> never seen them there. You may have uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew, sorry, Daniel. I don't know. Um, but they spread into wide society. Um, and what was the tragic part is that they got into low-income housing into um, the very group that don't have the fiscal resources to pay for control and sometimes even the um, cognitive awareness to know that bed bugs were a problem. Mm. And so often we saw infestations explode and we often saw these super infestations involving tens of thousands of bed bugs. Mm. And when we see that happening within um, apartment complexes, what happens is the bed bugs spread. And we've seen apartment complexes with 20% of rooms infested. In the US, in some cases, it's 100% of rooms. So to come back to what we see in the future, well, what we're seeing now is people aren't travelling. We're seeing hotels in lockdown and without guests. So, yes, there was bed bugs present in hotels, but we've seen a decline of bed bugs in hotels. They're not as common as what they used to be. And because there hasn't been the guests, there's a good chance a lot of the bed bugs will just naturally die out. So a bed bug will live for about five months at 22 degrees Celsius without a blood meal. But that's the extreme. Most of the population will die off before then. If the hotel is um, in a cold climate and all air conditioning is turned off, which is likely, then they can't live much longer. But we're no doubt going to see a decline in bed bugs in hotels because people aren't going to hotels and traveling. We'll see a decline in bed bugs on, in, in people's homes and public transport and that sort of situation. Yeah. The worrying aspect is that a lot of pest controllers have not been able to get into social housing True. because mm. of fear of COVID. Yes. And we could well expect bed bug problems to become much worse in social mm. housing. Mm. And they've become the reservoir Mm. for bed bugs in wider society. Oh, I understand. Okay. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm expecting we'll see a decline in bed bug numbers, gotcha. but they'll come back again without a question. In a bigger extreme. Interesting. T- time will tell, but um, they'll be more concentrated in low-income housing, much bigger, but mm. we may see a more rapid spread to wider society than what we did early on at the start of the bed bug resurgence. Interesting uh, theory. I would suggest uh, plus 12 months from today, we're going to revisit that topic and going to reassess whether that was true and really spread this much. Could be interesting, right? Oh, it could be. Yes. Yeah. So time will tell. It's like all these things of the future. Yeah. Speaking of the future, uh, Stephen, um, last but not least, uh, I would really love your take on how, um, you know, everybody's talking about sustainability or digital approach and pest control, et cetera. So you as a, a bed bug uh, a specialist, um, how do you think, you know, sustainable methods over, I don't know, insecticides or uh, even digital monitoring traps um, can or will at all affect or influence uh, the bed bug, uh, um, the bed bug control? Well, well, let's break it up into, say, pesticides versus um, traps and monitoring. So let's break it up. Now, when it comes to pesticides, because insecticide resistance has been so powerful, mm. it's forced us to do those non-chemical approaches. Mm. I mean, we had no choice. Mm. And I still think vacuuming, to me, is the best option for bed bug control. You can buy quite a cheap vacuum and really rapidly reduce the bed bug population. You probably won't control it unless it's a small population, but you can reduce the biomass in the infestation very rapidly. Mm. 
And the key things is you want a vacuum with ideal with plastic hoses. You can run hot water through to control them. Um, one with a disposable bag that you can take out, seal up, and then dispose of. Preferably a vacuum with a HEPA filter. So yeah, one yeah. of these filters that can um, basically remove all these particulate matters yeah. and even bed bug antigens. Because in the end, you want to protect your te yes. technician. And... Insects can cause respiratory problems. You can develop a, an allergy to them, a sensitivity. And so we need to protect the workers, and it's very important that we do. Mm -hmm. And um, so if we look at the more, um, well, the less toxic chemicals around at the moment, well, obviously the um, desiccant dust. And desiccant dust vary quite a, a lot. They work. They work quite well. But if we take diatomaceous earth um, in the powder form, it can take a couple of weeks to actually work. In the meantime, a bed bug could get a blood meal and then overcome that desiccation effect. Products like silica dioxide seem to be much quicker and kill bed bugs very rapidly. We don't fully understand how they work. It's said that um, they can dissolve the waxy cuticle layer of the bed bugs, but the fact is with a silica dioxide, they'll start dying within hours. Um, and that doesn't make sense to me that this mode of action could be just desiccation. Something else is going on. Mm. Um, heat treatments can work if they're used properly. I haven't done a lot of heat because we don't use a lot in Australia. Mm. And I see a lot of pest technicians buy heat units, quite expensive mm. heat units, but they fail. And they fail because they don't understand thermodynamics. They don't understand heat flow. They don't understand heat sinks, such as the um, brickwork behind you, which can be a major mm. heat sink, but also cause... Um, thermal protection to any bed bugs that are on the wall. And so there's a lot of knowledge when it comes to thermal control. And if you're thinking about getting to that, go and work with somebody else that's been doing it for a long time. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. Just don't go out and buy anything. Mm -hmm. You've got to learn. You've got to learn about heat flow. You've got to have a lot of um, sensors throughout a room to make sure you haven't got dead spots where treatment failure could could occur mm. and, it, and no matter what form of control you do one of the most important things that you've got to do is you've got to come back you've got to come back to allow eggs to hatch to check to see if you're exactly. successful <clears throat> now one one interesting thing is that um, most pest controllers would say that they're successful about 99% of the time when it comes to bed bug control I would estimate the actual figure is between 30 and 50% mm -hmm. And most pest controllers, every pest control out there who's done bed bugs will fail, and you will fail into the future. But it's important that you realise that you've failed, not your client. Mm. Because the fact is, if the client does their ring your back, that's not a sign that you've failed yeah. or you've been successful. It just means they probably don't want to use you again and mm. don't expect them ever to use you again. And chances are it will be on straight on the social media saying what a competent bunch of idiots mm. you've got. Mm. And so no matter what you do, you've always got to come back at least once. You may, in a severe infestation, you may come back four or five times to constantly check the progress of, of your treatment to yeah. make sure you're successful. And if you've got winter coming on when it gets colder, bed bugs become less active. And I've seen the infestation come back at the start of summer. And again, that's something you need to think about. So bed bug eggs take about, depending on the temperature, um, seven to 10 days to hatch at around 22 to 25 Celsius. So you've got to come back to allow for that. In colder climates, it's much longer. But always come back. So, <laughs> Don't rely on your client to be bitten as an yeah. indication that the bed bugs are gone. Really interesting to to um, reassess this in the future when uh, you know we are going to have profound proof for maybe a COVID correlating the effects of COVID correlating with bed bug increase decrease or you know stagnation. We're going to find out. Um, then then again, there are so many digital helpers in the pest control field. Um, so many people you know creating new Internet of Things connected devices. I know there yeah. are some bed bug traps uh, by some of the leading pest control operating companies in the world, but also by some new startups. There was a Finnish startup called Spotter, um, things, yeah. things like that. Uh, do you think um, you, you had a very interesting statement about um, the cost um, of a unit and also the time frame to control the trap? So maybe uh, something about that. Yes, there's a lot of problems when it comes to bed bug traps. And one thing you don't see is a lot of 
independent research is actually promoting them, and it's good reason because often the testing is just simply not being done. Mm. But one of the there's several key limiting factors when it comes to traps, and probably one of the most important is actually cost. Mm. If it's more than about four thousand four dollars US per room then hotels aren't interested. And in many countries, even that is way too much. Mm. And simply, we've seen a decline in bed bugs hotels, in hotels. They're just not as common as what they used to be. Mm -hmm. And if bed bugs aren't an ongoing problem, why would a hotel want to actually pay for these? Yeah. Um, in the US, where litigation is rife, there's, there's a great impetus to do it because they want to protect mm. not only the brand, but also prevent litigation mm -hmm. and by having a trap there it shows you're actually doing something even if the trap may not actually do anything mm -hmm. to be honest the problem with a lot of traps in hotels is that they're just way too expensive and we've seen many come on the market and just disappear sure. many are just too big and so there's nowhere convenient in a hotel room to put them without basically saying or most saying or advertising yes i've got a bed bug problem and if you've got a trap that's blatantly obvious, well, it suggests maybe you've got a bed bug problem and it's not something you want your guests to see. The other issue is that, well, do they work? Pheromones have a very limited area of attraction, maybe a foot. Many of the products, uh, many of the attractants, heat, and these are the pheromones. Often uh, the pheromones have to be replaced frequency. They're not a slow release. They are in some... But the fact is, in a bed, you've got this roughly a 70 kilo lump of meat that's pushing out carbon dioxide and they're pushing out heat. They're pushing out all these attractants. And bed bugs evolved to bite this very creature. Exactly. And how are these traps are going to outcompete this huge lump of meat? Well, it's not going to happen. That's reality. Yeah. And I'm very suspicious <clears throat> about all the traps out there. Um, maybe in low-income housing, some of these pitfall traps could be used. They can be used. Um, they're quite cheap, um, um, but they can fail quite rapidly too. And a colleague of mine in the UK has shown that some of these devices, if bed bugs are in there, they don't escape, but the bed bugs just will not go in there. Some of these products have a lip, and the bed bugs just run around the lip, and they don't fall in. And so a lot of these devices where publications have been released have done by people who've got a commercial interest in the product. So there and is no silver bullet or a such thing? Oh, no. And I remember testing some of these devices some years ago when I was testing another product yeah. and found that as soon as you got a little bit of accumulation of dirt, even after a week, mm. the bed bugs would start climbing out. Mm. And yeah. it's a problem. Yeah, and so when it comes to bed bugs, um, all these new products, and we've seen mm -hmm. these new products on it, mm -hmm. I sort of roll my eyes and and I tend not to even put them in the Fayette magazine because I prefer to stick to mm -hmm. yeah, the one thing about the Fayette magazine is we're not out to make money. We want to have quality information. That's so different to every pest control publication on the market. <laughs> we want quality. Um, who cares if it makes money? Um, I'm doing it voluntary, so I, I don't need to make money. That'd be nice, but, you know, <laughs> <And so> I, <laughs> not really. But um, And so I just want this as a, as a journal aimed at the upper end of the market, the, the technical managers, the leaders of the yeah. industry, to provide quality information to them. And so we, our articles are much bigger, they're much broader, there's fewer of them, but it's not full of adverts. And um, I don't want to put new products in there, in there unless there's something interesting. Mm. But having said that, the idea of a trap mm. where it, there's 24-7, which sends an alert back to whoever, mm. probably housekeeping would be best, is a great idea. I mean, it's a fantastic. Mm. In fact, I've wrote in the past about the benefits of it. But reality and a great idea are two completely different things, sadly, Daniel. I agree with you. It always uh, depends on the value calculation and uh, whether the value calculation shows then that the budget is not at all matching the device. Then we have a, yeah. you know, a spread that is not yet matched um, to be discussed in the near future when uh, more innovation is gonna gonna hit the market. Um, Stephen, thank you so much. Can you can you tell us something and show us maybe the the book you've written? 
Uh, well, I have several books. So the first one, and because there's a bit of a reflection here, I'll try to hold it up. So this was like a help guide that I produced around seven years ago. Do you have bed bugs? Uh, um, so do you have bed bugs help guide for the identification of bed bug infestations? Mm -hmm. It's a picture book showing people where bed bugs occur and what they look like. And this has been translated into a number of languages. And if anybody wants to have it translated into their own language, by all means, contact me. We can come to some arrangement. The other book that came out last year is Advances in the Biology and Management of Modern Bed Bugs. So I, the chief editor, was my baby, and I worked very closely with two terrific colleagues and two icons in the industry, Professor um, Dini Miller, who's one of the great legends in the US and a, and a wonderful, wonderful character and a beautiful person. And the fantastic Professor Chow Yang Lee, really the leading um, person in the urban pest control research area in Asia. And sadly, they just lost him because he moved to the US. Huh. And this particular book, <clears throat> it's over 400 pages. There's some 48 chapters, some over 60 authors from 13 different nations across the world. Wow. There's eight main sections. So this is actually the first <clears throat> academic book for 50 years. Now, I say academic because it is academic in nature <clears throat> in that the literature was reviewed, but the book is written in very easy-to-read format. And so pretty much all the book can be read by anybody with any experience. And there's only, I think, three chapters that are very technical. But there's eight main chapters. There's bed bugs through history. There's we focus on the bed bug resurgence, where we look at um, what's happened with the bed bugs resurgence across the major cottons around the world. There's information here that's never been seen before. There's sections of bed bugs biology, bed bug control, bed bug control in specific situations bed bugs in the law and bed bugs in the future. Mm -hmm. And this was written before COVID, so COVID wasn't factored into this. And this has put a spanner in our chapter, sadly. But we've got the icons of the industry, you know, the experts in the world are in this book. And it's if not in this book. book right? So, yeah. so we, can, we can put the link on the, in, the, in the description and everybody wants to get it. Uh, follow the link, please. Yeah, sadly, it was quite expensive, um, ridiculously expensive, and uh, I'm hoping it's a bit cheaper these days and widely the publisher will reduce the price. But, um, <laughs> yeah, but, but well, I'm very proud of the book. It took four years to produce. Um, there's a lot of work and, and there's information yeah, that will be used there relevant yeah. for the industry as a whole when it comes to bed bone management, really for decades to come. Yeah. Superb. So, Stephen, thank you so much for all the things we discussed. I mean, especially the correlation between bed bugs and COVID. Really interesting stuff there. We're going to revisit that again. And you stay safe and sound. Thank you so much. And if anybody wants to look at the Fayette magazine, it costs you a whole zero dollars except for your time on the internet. <laughs> if you go to www.fayetma.org. Um, Sorry, I'll keep that right. <laughs> so, if you want to, yeah. So, if anybody wants to read the Fayetteman magazine, it costs you absolutely nothing. It's free. You go to www.fayetteman. That's f a o p m a dot com. Um, the last issue is not on the website at the moment because the website's going through a major revision. Um, but if anybody wants to email Daniel to be put on the list, he can pass your contact on to me. Absolutely. And I'll email you when the next one out will be out because mm -hmm. we've got another one coming out about two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. And Fayette, very excitingly, is about to announce a virtual conference late in the year in huh. 18th, on 18th and 19th of November focusing on how you, the pest control and the pest control company, can survive and overcome the problems associated Perfect. with FAYETMA. So it's surviving beyond FAYETMA. So it's one of the most exciting programs I've ever seen. I'm actually on the organising committee and it's a great honour to work with some fantastic people. And we're actually finalising the program now and hoping to advertise that and we will advertise in the next issue. So keep an eye out that for that, Daniel. <laughs> we will. It's a must-see event, I think. And we're going to put all the links in the description so people follow Stephen, uh, really the guy for bed bugs and much more innovation and pest control. So thank you so much, Stephen, again. 
So thanks, thanks, Daniel, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to everybody and to everybody. Um, best wishes. Um, I hope this all gets over soon and I hope we can sort of meet face to face. There's so many colleagues out there. I just want to give a hug because I haven't seen them and, and fortunately they're all survived and my family's so far so good, but with the COVID situation getting worse daily, I mean, I mean, it's just terrifying. So to all of you, good luck to the future and I hope to see you all in person.